Welcome to Resiliency Matters. I'm Dr. Molly Marty. This is where we take the big resiliency research and best practices and break them down to tiny bite-sized pieces that you can use immediately. If you could experience more peace, aliveness, joy, would you spend the next 28 minutes with us? If we could give you a way to reduce anxiety and worry in the next 10 minutes, would you hang out with us? Who is us? <laughs> I'd like to introduce the other half of us today, my friend Jennifer Loudon. Jen is a best-selling author of six books that have been printed in a million copies mm -hmm. in several countries. She has written a national magazine column for one of Martha Stewart's magazines. Yep. She has DJed a national radio show. That sounds so cool. <laughs> and she has sat on Oprah's couch, and now she's sitting on my chair, and I could not be more excited. Oh, Molly, thank you so much for having me here to talk about something so important. But, you know, I before we talk more about what we're going to talk about, what led you to this work? And I think it's such an important part of the story to share. Well, thank you. I, resiliency is in my blood. Once I got to grad school in psychology and, and started studying it, I, I loved it. Started working with elite athletes mm -hmm. and then with business people and corporates. Mm -hmm. And a couple years ago, uh, my small community in Iowa lost three teens to suicide within mm -hmm. six months' time. Oh. It, it sent our community reeling, as you can imagine. Yeah. And it really pulled on my heart to think maybe I could use my knowledge and tools to help these parents help these teachers, and most of all, create a safety net for these right, kids. Right, wow. And so I, when I think about something like that, so sad happening to your town, but I also think about how we all have so many challenges in life and how resiliency, we all need it. And when we're more resilient, we affect everyone around us, the people we work with, people we love. So what a mission you have going. I love it. Well, thank you, <laughs> and I love your mission too. So tell us a little bit more about how you got into uh, speaking and writing about self-compassion and yeah. self-love. Well, I did it because in my mid-20s, I really crashed and burned, and I really wanted to be a successful screenwriter, and I was living in Hollywood, and I was pushing myself relentlessly and it wasn't coming and it wasn't working and I got a terrible case of writer's block and a lot of other things happened until my life got really really small and during this time the kind of guidance we all get was coming right and by guidance I mean inner guidance mm -hmm. we all have inner wisdom we just numb it out we dismiss it we look to experts to tell us so I was doing that and I wasn't listening to this voice that was saying take some time off stop writing for a while stop pushing yourself go get a job doing something else and I would say yeah 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 when I write another screenplay and I sell it for I had a figure in mind it had to be four hundred thousand dollars which is ridiculous um, and I kept pushing it and I kept getting more and more stuck and worse worse writer's block and my agent wasn't calling me back and finally one day I really Really surrendered to that feeling of okay I'm gonna give myself a break it was probably my first act of real self-kindness in my life and in that moment a voice as clear as if you said it to me said the woman's comfort book which turned out to be the first book I wrote I had no idea what it meant I wasn't used to hearing voices in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> <Probably a good laughs> <thing. laughs> and um, it began this journey of really learning through research and through talking to other women what does it mean to be kind to yourself and then that book became a bestseller by word of mouth in 1992, 21 years ago, and I started to teach and learn more about how do you live self-compassion, how do you live self-kindness, why is it important? And now we have so much research to show why it is, and we can talk about that while we're here today. Yeah. I call resiliency quiet work, and oh. it includes the quiet work of that stillness and that listening to the voices that you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, within our community, it's a lot of quiet work of the connections, the relationships, the mm -hmm. just that behind the scenes work to strengthen, create an environment in which these kids can thrive. Yeah. And I think that that story so wonderfully highlights that this is quiet work yeah. at times. Yeah, thank you. I love that. Quiet work. Yes. Doesn't look sexy on the outside, but we need to be doing it on the inside so we can have the impact we want. Exactly. Which is exactly what you're doing in your community. Just so exciting. And it may help to even uh, define resiliency. Oh, I, guess I, I wanted you to do that. Thank you. <laughs> because I think of it, resiliency really has two components, one of strength and one of capacity. So it has a component of, of being strong, but building a bank in which you can fall back on. And the, the bigger uh, amount of capacity you have, the easier you're able to bounce back or bounce through. Mm -hmm. So I say that resiliency is the ability to cope with, to um, respond to, and to grow through adversity. Grow through. I love that because you can come out to a different place, you can come out to a better place. 
You certainly can. Yeah. And uh, we talk about uh, those stories of people being completely different than they mm -hmm. were before and, and being so grateful right. for right. those adversities in their Tr life. True for me in my life. Um, so I know we promised people that we would teach them something in the first 10 minutes. Yes, <laughs> and I know the time will fly today. So let's get to yeah, our first tool. That, yeah, it's something that you can really take away to help you with worry and stress and anxiety. I, and before I tell you the tool, I think the most important thing I want you to know is worry, stress, and anxiety is part of being human. And we live in a time where we're much more isolated. So it's much easier to think this is only happening to you. And if you're listening now and you think that, I want you to know it's not true. It happens to all of us every day. And knowing that can actually actually lower your stress and anxiety. But here's another tool. We've had uh, about two decades of research in a field called neurocardiology. Now dig this. I think this is like the coolest thing. I think everything we're telling you today is cool. <laughs> but you've got 40,000 plus neurons in your heart. You have a brain in your heart. Isn't that amazing? A heart it's not, brain. Yeah, heart brain. It's not <laughs> shaped like your cranium brain. Those neurons are spread out throughout your heart, but they affect how you think and what you're capable of and your resili resiliency hugely. And there's a really simple way that you can tap into this wisdom and use it anywhere you are. Nobody knows, has to know you're doing it. You can do it in a meeting. You can do it when you're angry at somebody. You can do it when you want to get ready for a stressful day. And that is to bring up a good memory, a pleasant, wonderful memory. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be an important moment in your life. Whatever comes to you is great. Put your hand on your heart if you can. Breathe in and out of your heart like your heart has little lungs on it. And then f focus on the feelings that that memory brings to you. Don't analyze them. Don't have to name them. But just focus on them and let them grow stronger in your heart. A whole minute of that does this incredible thing. The information from your heart brain going to your cranium brain when you're freaked out, when you're worried, anxious, or stressed, looks like chaotic electromagnetic waves. Well, it is chaotic <laughs> electromagnetic waves. And when you do that, one minute of a pleasant emotion, just really lingering in it, savoring it, one of my favorite words, those electromagnetic waves smooth out. And it opens up the higher capacities of your brain, where your empathy, your intuition, your creative, your creativity, your problem solving, you know, you need in all those meetings or with your teenagers yes. <laughs> or when you're teaching. Yeah, so those open up for you and then you have the capacity. What a yeah. wonderful tool. Yeah. So when we come back, that's our first of many tools. Um, we are going to cover two more because our promise to you at Resiliency Matters is that you will leave with a minimum of three tools uh, every time we meet. So, the, so this tool <laughs> is use your heart to change your day. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about that and give you two more. Use your heart to change your day. Hey, I'm Anderson Cooper. As a parent, you want to make sure that your child knows how to deal with bullying when they see it happening. And chances are they want to help, but they don't really know how. Well, teach them that the best thing to do is calmly walk away, find a teacher or other adult, and speak up. And do your part. Be that adult they can talk to and trust will listen. Join me to help stop bullying. Go to stopbullying.gov to find out more. Can you come with me? Imagine what you'd see if every child had a book to read. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. 
Take time to be a dad today. Call or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. Hello, this is Molly Marty, and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. I still have my hand on my heart, and I am somewhere in Ireland, actually on the Cliffs of Moher, oh. because is the, that's where I go, where Monty and I spent our honeymoon, and oh it transports gosh. me back. I love that. But the beautiful thing is it doesn't matter where you no. are. No. Uh, if you notice, Jen actually stepped us away from the special place you were at to the feelings, and yeah, it's really those important. feelings. It's not about having a particular experience. You can even make it up, what you think a beautiful beach would be, mm -hmm. um, as long as it evokes the feelings. You did such a fabulous job covering oh, that research. Uh, they call it coherence, which I That's, find I always a, forget that. Yeah, yeah, it's a really meaningful word, mm -hmm. I think, that it changes the electromagnetic connections. And the idea is that your brain not only tells your heart and your body what to do, but your heart is speaking mm -hmm. and your brain is picking up guidance mm -hmm. from that. And it shifts uh, a lot of physiological functions. I find it fascinating. There's more connections between our, crani our, our heart brain to our cranium brain than our cranium brain to our heart brain. Like, that's amazing. Like, all the poets and the scripture was right. The heart knows best. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of sayings around that. And yeah. it, it's really thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, I always say, if you want to make quick and lasting change, if you can bring all three of those together, mm. thoughts, emotions, and behavior, it's wow. go, you're going to have more impactful change. Okay. But you can really pick where you start. And I think right. for a lot of people, picking that emotion, picking that heart center, it's a really nice place to start, very effective. And what I love about it is it only takes a minute. It, a minute. <laughs> and you can do it anywhere. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to put your hand on your heart. And it affects the people around you because that electromagnetic yes. energy mm -hmm. goes out two to 15 feet so we just changed, did you feel the energy change between <laughs> us? Like you're a little nervous doing TV, and then you, you, you do that, and like the people around you were affected. So it's great for your family, for rocky meetings when you're doing mediation. Yes, yeah. yes. Sales. <laughs> Everything, communication. Yeah, yeah communication. Yes. Yeah, great. So that Yay. was a, a great tool. <laughs> I am going to share with our audience now our uh, model of resiliency. It's called the EASY model of resiliency, the E-C-C-E. -E. And the idea, again, is it takes all of this research and best practices and it breaks it down in a way that you as parents, as teachers, as community activists, as people who just love and support these kids. And again, we're all human, so you can use these tools for yourself. And, and for us as adults, um, but it's really focused on how to create an environment in which kids can thrive. That easy stands for engage, mm. connect, challenge, and enrich. And there's a 20-factor research-based model. It's basically uh, what I've been doing for the last two years, <laughs> is diving even deeper into this research, learning from best practices, learning from other communities mm -hmm. uh, who have lost children, and putting it all together in a way that um, we can start to strengthen our communities and our youth. What I find fascinating about the work that you're doing is it really looks at it from a broad perspective. It's the whole culture. It's how we're all operating together. Mm -hmm. And instead of just making it about the kids, yes. or instead of just making it about the teachers, yes. or making it about the parents, right? We're such a blame culture, and blame does not help resiliency. It increases shame, and shame thrives in the darkness. Shame does thrive in the darkness, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that, uh, about vulnerability. I had the pleasure of hearing you speak, and we're mm. going to uh, go into that in a bit. But yesterday I heard you speak, and you talked about uh, some of Brene Brown's work, mm -hmm. vulnerability. Uh, you are talking shadow comforts. Right. But can you speak more about shame versus guilt and in, in shame and how it really can harm? Well, I think the greatest definition of shame and guilt is shame. You do something bad, you're bad. And guilt is you do something bad and you, you see that you want to change that behavior. You don't want to do that again. You don't associate it with your self-worth, with your identity. Shame is if you cut somebody off in traffic, oh, I'm such a bad person. Guilt is, oh, wow, I'm really sorry I did that. Ah, that wasn't good. That was lousy driving, right? And you can feel the difference when I say it. And shame disappears when we can have intimate, vulnerable conversations with people we trust. And we can talk to them about what we're ashamed of. And what shame tends to do, though, is hide us, put us into the dark where we're not talking, we're not having those vulnerable conversations, we're puffing up, we're armoring up. 
Yes. And we're pretending to have it all together. I uh, gave a talk a few weeks ago in my town. I live in Washington State and uh, with just a small group of women who practice yoga. And we were talking about how do you take yoga off the mat? So it would be no different. How do you take what you learn in your church off the mat? How do you, out of the church, how do you mm -hmm. really live these principles that you go into church or temple or mosque or the yoga studio to learn? And one thing that came up so much for them was they have to pretend to have it all together. They have to pretend to be positive all the time in their community. And and it was so, it was the, probably the biggest healing that happened that night was for them to get a chance to be real with each other. So that's an example of being vulnerable, putting yourself out there and getting something back from it. But you have to be careful who you choose to do that with. You do. It's very important. It is important. You, otherwise you'll increase your shame. And that's where our concept of trusted adults building these relationships. Yes, and having mentors in your life. Yes. Yeah. So guilt can be a good thing. That's one thing I, yes. I want people to take away from this. And the second in looking through my model, I really see your work housed in that uh, enrich piece. And mm. that's mental, physical, emotional, uh, spiritual, and uh, contributing. Mm. Get us something in the physical <laughs> realm. I, we need to eat right. We need to drink our, our water, hydrate. Right. We need uh, exercise. But right. uh, do you have a, a tip that we can uh, use share today? today? Use yes. today, right I do, now. but I want to say two more th things about physical first. Okay. We tend to think of ourselves as giant sticks, um, giant heads without a body, right? <laughs> our culture doesn't like your body unless it looks a certain way. So that is the first idea, is to uh, start to bring in the physical with a sense of honoring that your body, you're actually is just as important in your resiliency and in your happiness as your thoughts, your mind, your spirit. And we tend to disregard the body in this culture. Most of us don't get enough sleep, but we think that we do, right? Not getting enough sleep after two days is the same as being legally drunk. Isn't that amazing? But you don't know you're legally drunk. <laughs> you think you're actually getting enough sleep. The third idea that I want to share is this idea of breaking the body trance. And this is something I am fascinated by. We live in a culture, and we live in a time where we spend a lot of time sitting down, a lot of time leaning forward, <laughs> either typing or driving. And we get into a very restricted way of being. And it actually affects what we think, how we feel, and our creativity and our brain function. So you can break the body trance so easily. Let's do it right uh, now. And I'm thinking, of course, of our kids and how yes. much time they sit at their desk. They sit at their school. desk and looking at screens, they do the same thing we do. So, so teachers, so, listen up here. Yeah, <laughs> but break the body trance can change the whole mood of your classroom. So stand up. All right. Do you notice anything different? I'm breathing a little deeper yeah, already. <laughs> right, just standing up is breaking the body trance. The next thing you can do, and I know you have a, a little you know, shoulder injury, but just let yourself stretch. Let yourself lift your arms over your head. You can do this anywhere, right? Nobody really yeah. knows what you're doing. Move Shake around a little bit. We tell our bodies what to do all the time, right? In exercise class, we have to move a certain way. But letting your body move the way it wants to mm. breaks the body trance. So is just allowing yourself to have a couple of deep breaths. Shallow breathing, shallow brain function, less resiliency. And then if you really want to get crazy, you can do a little laughter yoga, which is just going, ha, 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 All right, I'll stop watching. You can just keep going. Just a little ha, ha, ha. we have everybody in the studio <laughs> lit up, too, because it is contagious. It is contagious. And you're, there's nothing funny. It's not about a joke. So it's just a few ha, ha, ha breaths. Oxygenates you and change, changes what you are aware of and what's available to you. So this has such a sense of play. Yeah, it does. Right? Play so, is important. So break the body trance often and lighten up a little. Mm. We'll be back with our third tip after this. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all living united to ensure the academic success of millions of kids in our communities all the way to graduation day. But that won't happen without you. So take the pledge at unitedway.org. Make a difference in the life of a child. Suit up like your favorite NFL players and become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor with United Way. Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look! Your crush is looking at you. Poor <laughs> you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. because no one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov.
Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. Now it's time for This Week in Bad Stats. Bad stats? Horrible stats. Here goes. 260. That's how many runs were walked in with the bases loaded last season. Wow, very good. Here's a tough one, though. Three and four. No idea. That's the number of kids who witnessed bullying. Three out of four. Not a good stat. No, it's not, but that can change. Kids want to help, but they don't know how. You can visit stopbullying.gov and give them the tools they need to help prevent bullying. There are plenty of safe ways kids can help at stopbullying.gov. Welcome back to Resiliency Matters. I'm Dr. Molly Marty, and I'm here with best-selling author and a dear friend of mine, Jennifer Loudon. We were over break doing a little myth busting. Once you get us talking on resiliency, it's hard to stop us. And so we're going to be sharing some myth busting with you about self-talk. I want to share one thing before. We also talked about the Community Resiliency mm -hmm. Project's new uh, You Matter, We Need mm -hmm. You campaign. And I Jenna, love that slogan, can I just tell you? Thank you. That slogan came to be, I sat down with some educators, mm -hmm. guidance counselors, and uh, looking at that model that we've shared with our audience today, and it's still a lot of research, a lot of words, and, and we said, what is the core right, of the this? Takeaway. What is the takeaway? We mm -hmm. call it the wham, the walk away mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. What is the wham for the kids? And it boiled down to that. We want every child to hear that you matter in a variety of ways because they don't all listen and take it in in the same way right. from a variety of places, a variety of people, um, but to get the tools that they need because that's vulnerable even to accept that, to hear right. you matter, yeah, because yes, someone and, and receive it right. and believe it. And then the we need you brings us back to what we were talking about, that, mm. that five piece of mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and contributing. Mm. And contributing stands Not on its own because uh, you gain so much more than you give and so that piece of contributing adds to resiliency. But it's also, um, you know, we talked about where the project came from, and it mm -hmm. came from the loss of these three teens. And our community was simply less in, mm -hmm. in so many ways without mm -hmm. them. And it really made me more aware of our interconnections and how when um, the kids are strong and parents are strong and we're thriving, we thrive together. And when we're less, we're less. And the other thing I love about it is that it, it, it you have to take responsibility for your gifts. And I think what happens so often in our culture is we don't. We sort of, we think because we're not um, beautiful or we're not incredibly ge a genius or these kind of examples of extraordinariness that were shown to us in the media all the time, then we don't matter. And the exact opposite is true. Each of us has some piece of light that has to be here in the world. And I love that slogan because it makes, it makes you want to stop up and express that light and what are you here to do and you don't know what it you don't know what impact it's going to have but it is going to have an impact it is and so we one of our camps we do quarterly camps with the uh, students and one of that was called light it up campaign mm, perfect <laughs> and we help them and I, and I started by saying how many of you just have something that lights you up that you can't not do it you love to do it you right. love to share it yeah. and about half the kids raised their hand and I said well, we're going to keep asking questions right. until everybody's hands are raised and we got kids to really identify their light and right. multiple lights right. what are they doing to grow those lights mm -hmm. how do they share them who helps them because mm -hmm. we're building in a lot of uh, mentoring and trusted adult mm -hmm. relationships and so um, we had the kids start with that and now we're uh, doing some movies around that and, and really highlighting some mm. of the students lights and so uh, the in, in brief the you matter we need you has kind of three components one is to educate our teachers mm -hmm. our staff school staff because they're in a unique position to be with mm -hmm. our, our youth so on uh, suicide intervention and, and crisis response, and mm -hmm. even to know what are the warning signs. Right. Um, kids in, need to be educated as well with their peer leaders. Mm -hmm. So there's that educational component. There's the uh, piece where we're going to our community and we're mobilizing them mm -hmm. to say, we need mentors, Which we need your involvement. It, right? yes. And the beautiful thing is that as they mentor in their area of mm -hmm. interest, they become stronger and more right. resilient. Right. And the third piece is we take it directly to the kids. And that's something I was so grateful. You were at Mount Vernon High School this morning doing an assembly with that message to our students that you matter, we need you. And you shared a, a, an example. I'm still kind of thinking about it. Mm. So uh, you were really talking about, because you had uh, depression as a teenager, yeah. you had some dark times, and yep. you were very open with mm -hmm. the kids and shared your experience. But you gave a little tool. So this mm. is kind of a bonus tool uh, about what you can do when you really feel like you're, you're alone and, and 
Yeah, so next time you're feeling incredibly alone in the world, uh, you're the only one who's feeling the despair, the darkness, the one, only one who got a mean email from your boss, the only one who has mean teenagers who, it's like living with them, is like living with sandpaper sometimes. Imagine that, yeah, is it possible that someone else in the world, at least one person is feeling just as bad as you are? And then send them love, send them ease, send them, I wish for you well-being, I wish for you peace, I wish for you some relief. And this will change your physiology and increase your resiliency just by doing that, just by contributing through thoughts and emotion to someone you don't know. We have to get to self-talk before we run out of time, though. Yes, <laughs> well, uh, that myth-busting we were talking about. Yeah, really about. quick, we have to talk about self-talk. Yes, because it is a common belief that the more hard, harder you are yes. on yourself, the more critical you are, the better you'll do, the higher you'll uh, perform and achieve. Right. Uh, Straighten us out here, Jen. <laughs> Every study shows the exact opposite. The harder you are on yourself, the more critical you are on yourself, the less willpower you have, the less you'll achieve your goals, that weight you've wanted to lose, that promotion you want to get, the way you want to be with your kids isn't going to happen when you're criticizing yourself. Most of us speak to ourselves with more cruelty than we would speak to even someone we really, really hate. Even those people you know, on the TV shows that were like, I can't believe you're so mean to each other, we wouldn't speak to them that way. Yeah. So it's incredibly important to begin to learn to listen in on what you're saying to yourself. You can't take my word for it. You have to learn to eavesdrop on your own thoughts so you can feel, I know this sounds a little uncomfortable, but you can feel the pain of how you're speaking to yourself. And if you really want to make this work, start writing down what you hear. And even write it down in some index cards and leave it someplace where you can see it. Wow, this is how I'm speaking to myself. Mm. Notice how it makes you feel. Notice how it affects your resiliency, your mood, your body. Remember that body, break the body mm. trance. Body constriction comes with those thoughts that shut down your higher capabilities in your brain. And then start to ask yourself, only after you've become aware, how would I like to speak to myself? Don't try to ask, uh, you know, force in happy thoughts. That creates cognitive dissonance. It doesn't work. But like, how would I talk to Molly if she had had a hard day? What would be honest and kind and compassionate? And begin to try to experiment with doing that for yourself. You will find that your ability to achieve what you want, to be the person you want, begins to unfold with so much less effort and so much more heart and so much more connected to what I call your essential goodness. Yes. What a wonderful place to end Yay! that celebrating <laughs> part of the resiliency project is celebrating that essential goodness mm -hmm. within each of us. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So we gave some bonus tools, but we gave three tips today, mm -hmm. and I want to review those quickly. Tip number one, use your heart to change your day. Mm. Tip number two, break the body trance <laughs> often. <laughs> <laughs> and three, and I think most importantly, mm. remember to stay on your own side. Yeah. This is Dr. Molly Marty with Resiliency Matters, and I want to remind you that you matter. We need you.